pleasant Sabbath, everyone. Okay, let's try this again because I do not talk to myself. Pleasant Sabbath, everyone. I have an excuse to sound like this. I'm under the weather. It would be interesting if my voice could be like this all the time. <clears throat> I was thinking that we truly serve an amazing God. Thank you to the Adams Burrow family, Barrow family. My life, I give you. My heart, I give you. I give you my all. Thank you for everybody else who participated in Family Day. It is a pleasant surprise when your wife can introduce you. You can't really say anything in rebuttal because you go home with her. But thank you, sweetheart, for the kind words. I'd like to introduce to you someone that you should know. My mother, she's holding my daughter, and beside her is my nephew. He is my third oldest nephew, even though the two that precede him are all the same age. Twins, and then three weeks later, Rashid was born. I promised him I wouldn't tell any stories, so the story of me holding you while you were sleeping and you slept on my chest, I will keep to myself. I'd just like to welcome everyone, and I think it's time to do what God has asked us to do. Bow your heads with me as we pray, Father. Indeed, it is a privilege to be in your courts. Lord, at this moment I am finding myself at a loss for words. And the funny thing is, God, it is okay. Because, God, I don't want to be heard. I want us, dear Father, to hear what you would say. So, word of God, speak. Pour down like rain and wash our eyes to see your majesty. Help us to be still and know that you are in this place. Help us to stay and rest in your holiness. In Jesus' name, amen. When I spoke with Brother Lovardo a few weeks back, told me that the theme was Lost in the House. And so the title of the message today is In the House. Now, I will invite you to open your Bibles to Luke chapter 15. Luke chapter 15. I will begin reading at verse 1, going all the way down through to verse 24. Luke chapter 15. Starting at verse 1, it reads, Then all the tax collectors and sinners drew near to him, to hear him. And the Pharisees and the scribes complained, saying, This man receives sinners and eats with them. So he spoke this parable to them, saying, What man of you, having a hundred sheep, if he loses one of them, does not leave the ninety and nine in the wilderness and go after the one which is lost until he finds it. And when he has found it, he lays it on his shoulders, rejoicing. And when he comes home, he calls together his friends and his neighbors, saying to them, Rejoice with me, for I have found my sheep which was lost. I say to you that likewise there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents than over ninety-nine just persons who need no repentance. Or what woman having ten silver coins, if she loses one coin, does not light a lamp and sweep the house and search carefully until she finds it? And when she has found it, she calls her friends and neighbors together, saying, Rejoice with me, for I have found the peace which I have lost. Likewise, I say to you, that there is joy in the presence of the angels of God over one sinner who repents. Then he said, A certain man had two sons. The younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of goods that fall to me. 
So he divided to them his livelihood. And not many days after, the younger son gathered all together and journeyed to a far country. And there he wasted his possessions with prodigal living. But when he had spent all, When he had spent all, there arose a severe famine in the land, and he began to be in want. Then he went and joined himself to a citizen of that country and sent him into his fields to feed swine. He would have gladly filled his stomach with the pods that the swine ate, and no one gave him anything. <laughs> but when he came to himself, he said, how many of my father's hired servants have bread enough to spare? And I perish with hunger. I will arise and go to my father and I will say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. And he arose and came to his father. <laughs> but when he was still a great way off, his father saw him, had compassion on him, ran and fell on his neck and kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and in your sight. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Bring out the best robe and put it on him and put a ring on his hands and sandals on his feet and bring the fatted calf here and kill it and let us eat and be merry for this my son was dead and is alive again he was lost and is found and they began to be merry growing up in my household was a fun time I promised my mother I will not tell any stories of her, so I'll tell stories of my sister because she's not here. My sister Michelle loves The Wizard of Oz. Familiar with the story? No? Never seen The Wizard of Oz? Well, The Wizard of Oz is about a young girl named Dorothy. Dorothy lives in Kansas. Dorothy is with her family, and a tornado comes, and Somehow, someway, Dorothy is transported in her mind to a place called Oz. And here in Oz, she meets all these interesting characters. She has a scarecrow for a friend. She has a cowardly lion. She has a tin man with no heart. And, sorry, the scarecrow has no brain. The tin man has no heart. The lion has no courage. And she has her little dog, Toto. The whole time, Dorothy is trying to get back home to her family. And no matter what she does, Dorothy still can't get home. Until she says those famous words, there's no place like home, no place like home, no place like home. I remember in my household, there was no place like home. We didn't have very much. Mom worked two jobs, still does. Dad worked. Siblings and I, we would have fun playing make-believe together. Somehow, some way, I was always the bad guy. But even though we didn't have very much, it was always fun to come home. Even if we had a hard day at school, Brother Lovardo, the best place and the best times I can remember is at home. Because at home, my sister would always do something to make me laugh. Or I would do something to make her laugh. Or my brother would do something to make us both laugh. We would have such a good time at home. Home for me was a place of safety. It was a place of security. It is a place where I could grow and nurture and develop. Home was the very first school that I attended. Home was the very first place where I learned how to pray. And it is interesting to me that I wish every household could be like my home. But not every household is. 
Am I speaking truth? We have some homes today where children get abused. Am I speaking true? Talk to me. We have some households today where spouses are being abused. We have households today where, 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 where there's so much corruption going on inside that home is not necessarily a good environment to be in. And instead of being at home, people choose to go other places. One of the leading reasons why children, young men, particularly join gangs, is because their home environment isn't exactly what it should be. And the house goes quiet. But that's all well and good when it's our individual homes. This is our home. We are a family, are we not? And in the family, sometimes there are abuses that happen. Don't go quiet on me. Sometimes there are people inside the house who get abused inside the house of God. So much so that now even conferences and divisions and even the GC has to make special legislation to protect the vulnerable elderly and children abused in the church there's no place like home it's interesting Jesus addresses this problem here in Luke chapter 15 he starts it starts off by having the scribes and the Pharisees confront Jesus they say this man eats and sits and dines and hangs out with sinners. My mom would always tell me, I don't know if it's true or not, but if you show me your company, I will tell you who you are. And yet still, Jesus' company are tax collectors and sinners. They're fishermen who are the riffraff of society. Peter had one of the worst tempers that I can remember next to mine. And this is Jesus' company. So what does that say about Jesus? So Jesus addresses this question in an interesting fashion. He tells three parables. The first says, you have a hundred sheep. And if one of the sheep goes astray, will you not leave the ninety and nine to go and find the one? That sounds pretty good, Elder. But in my training that I've received at school, I was always taught that the needs of the many outweigh the needs of the few. And it would be more profitable for me to leave the one in the wilderness than to let the 90 and 9 go. Why? Because sheep can get taken out by wolves. Another sheep could wander off. So many different things can happen. Why would I leave 99 sheep to go look for the one wayward sheep that is astray? Add up to me, Pastor Dunchy. But Jesus says... It is more profitable to leave the 90 and 9 and go search for the one. That shows the value of the one sheep that he has compared to the 99. And sometimes in the house of God, if we are honest with ourselves, we have the one sheep that has left our fold. But we are more content with the 90 and 9 that sit in the building than the one that is outside somewhere wandering. Because it takes too much effort on my part to go out and look for that one. I got to make sure that when I bring him in, I'm going to make it so that they like what's going on inside here rather than bring that one to Jesus himself. I want to fix up everything so nice and clean rather than bring the one to Jesus himself. The interesting thing is this. It is the shepherd who goes after the sheep and not the under-shepherd. Where are all the helpers? 
A shepherd can't take care of 99 sheep himself. But none of the other helpers go after this one sheep. Then he, he finishes off this parable by saying, he, puts, he finds the sheep, he puts it on his shoulders, and he carries the sheep back, and he brings everybody into his house so they can rejoice with him because the sheep is found. Then he goes and tells another parable, the lost coin. Now, I'm going to be honest with you. In my pockets are two handkerchiefs. I wish these handkerchiefs were money, but sadly they are not. But I don't really care that I don't have much money because God has always been faithful. If I had a hundred dollars, ten dollars rather, and I left my ten dollars in loonies on the dresser, and one loony goes missing. I've worked hard for my ten dollars. Let me put a pause there for a moment. I'm looking at my mom and I remember a story. Sorry, Mom. I remember when I wanted these new pair of shoes. And I went and I asked my mom for the shoes. She said, boy, didn't I just buy you shoes two weeks ago? I'm like, yes, Mom, but you don't understand. These are the shoes I need for basketball. Please, please, please. And she's like, listen, do you know how hard I work for the $2 that I'm going to give you right now? There's effort that went into the money that I made. Same with this woman. You have 10 silver coins and you lose one. Would you sweep the entire house for one dollar? For a dollar. Would you sweep your room for 10 cents? I see a lot of people like, mm-mm, I'll just go back to work, I'll work one more minute. But if the $10 is your entire savings, the $1 has more value than if you had $1,000 and you lost one. So when you lose the one and you sweep the entire house, which means you do a diligent search for the one, you rejoice when you find the one. How many of us lose things? Wednesday morning, Elder Thompson. After my studies, I put my glasses here. And I'm searching the entire house for my glasses. I looked in the kitchen cupboard. I looked in the trash. I looked in the, the, the laundry bin. I looked everywhere I could for my glasses and I couldn't find it. And I was too embarrassed to wake up my wife and say, honey, do you know where I left my glasses? So I searched and I searched and I searched. And when I couldn't do it, I put my hand on my head and I said, thank you, Jesus. <laughs> it is easy to lose things. But when something is valuable to you, you will go to the umpteenth end to go and find it. When you need something, you will search high and low. You will tear your house apart. You will even go into the garage or wherever you need to go. Backtrack even to work to go and find the one thing that you have lost. And that is why when this woman found her coin, she can gather her friends together and rejoice because this one coin had so much value. And then he ends like this. A certain man had two sons. The younger says to the father, give me what is mine. He takes, he goes off, the Bible says, to a far country. He spends everything that he has, throwing the best parties, making sure that he's there at every NBA All-Star game, front row. He's on the 50-yard line at the Super Bowl. 
He's, and if you don't know what the 50-yard line at the Super Bowl means, it means that you have probably mortgaged your house for that one seat. He has done all to show that he is the it thing in the town. And notice that he doesn't stay close to where he's living or his father resides. He goes a very far distance. And when he is there and he has wasted everything, then a famine hits. And when the famine hits, all the people he has spent his money on are nowhere to be found. All the people that used to come to his parties are nowhere to be found. All the people who used to dap it up with him and have a good time with him are nowhere to be found. And he is left alone to do the one task that is beneath him feeding swine. I can guarantee you this. Please, Lord, don't make this happen. There are certain jobs I'm just not doing. I am not feeding swine. Let alone eating what swine eats. And he was so hungry and desperate that he ate swine food. Can you imagine? Zion is three months old. I cannot picture in my mind my daughter being in a place where she would have to rummage through swine feed to get meal. That to me is unthinkable. And yet still, this young man, instead of going home, chooses to eat swine food instead of humbling himself before his father. We talk about being lost in the house. There are a couple of reasons why we are lost. The sheep was lost because the sheep wander. Sheep normally wander. That's what they do. They're built to wander. The coin was lost because somehow it was misplaced. And the boy was lost because he made a choice that it's better to go and party outside than stay with his father inside. All three are lost. And yet still all three are lost in the presence of the shepherd, in the presence of the woman, and in the presence of the father. How is it that we have people coming to church today who we introduce to Jesus on a weekly basis and they are lost in the house? How is it that we could hear sermon after sermon and sing song after song and know our doctrines inside out and backwards and still be lost in the house? How is it that you can go from cradle roll to the adult class and still be lost in the house? It is different if they're lost outside or they're lost somewhere else. But to be lost here where home and safety should abide is a very interesting thought. It boils down to our choice. The young man had a choice to stay. Just like all of us have a choice to stay. My family dynamic wasn't perfect. Yes, had mother and father, my siblings. I can't recall a day that my parents argued. I know they did. Why? Because I argue in my marriage, so if I do, then they must have. I don't always win my arguments, but hey, that's a different story. I know that there are times that my parents sacrificed to give me the things that I wanted, and there are times that they said no because they just couldn't afford it. There are difficulties in every home, and yet still when we come into the house of God, we put on our nice suit, we tie our bow ties or our long ties, or we come with our shirts or whatever, we put on our best, we come in and we make it seem as if everything is fine, and then when I, my life doesn't add up to your life, then I think there's something wrong with me because... I'm clearly not on the same level as you, and instead of staying in the house, I, I choose to go. There are way too many people that have come through the doors of Apple Creek and have left. And I'm not even talking about young people, because they're not the only ones leaving. Young and old are leaving the house of God, choosing to go other places. It's one thing if they go to a different church, 
down the street to, to Toronto East or to, to Toronto West or to Philadelphia or wherever. But when you leave the house of God and leave the presence of God, I have a problem. Here's my problem. You're leaving God and you're, you're blaming God for something he has never done. The shepherd never told the sheep to go astray. The woman never purposely lost the coin. And the father never told the son, pack up your stuff and leave. And yet still we went. Can we be real? Can we? If you choose to leave the house of God because of something somebody said, you're an idiot. And I'm sorry if it offends you, but it's true. Because I didn't die for you. And I'm not coming back for you. I didn't bring you in. My father, my, my mom, sorry. Mom would always say when she gets upset with me, I brought you in this world and I'll take you out. But she's yay high. But even if she tries to take me out, she's not the one who gave me life. And she's not the one who sustains me on a daily basis. Therefore, if somebody says something to me that upsets me in the house, I'm not leaving. I'm staying and I'm dealing with it. Why? Because we are family. Not every day my sister and I got along. There are days where we actually got into a fist fight. I'm much younger, by the way, I'm don't say pastor's abusive. No, he's not. I was much, much, much younger. But because my sister and I get into a fight and an argument, I am not leaving my family. I'm not packing my bags, I'm not gonna be your friend and walk out. That to me is foolishness. Because my sister doesn't pay the bills. So why would you leave God because of something that I did to you? The Bible says that when the young man came to his senses, I wonder if we actually grasp what that means. It means that you have filled your stomach so much with swine food that something finally clicked in your head and said, you know what? This is foolishness. How many people in my dad's house have enough to eat? And I'm here starving for hunger. How many people of my dad's servants have good food on their table and they could share with their friends and I'm eating swine food? It's about time, brothers and sisters, that some of us come to our senses and we realize that it is better to be miserable in the presence of God than to have a little bit of joy outside in the world somewhere. It is better to wrestle with God over whatever issue that you may have rather than deal with it all alone because when you deal with it all alone, the very same people who were with you on the journey are nowhere with you when your trouble hits. But the only person who is there with you is God, God alone. The interesting thing is this, the boy goes away and when he comes to his senses, he realizes that some way he has seen his father exemplify grace to the servant. That's why he can make the decision to go home. Because if his father was going to write him off and kill him, he wouldn't take the chance. So he's seen grace in his father. So I'd rather take my chances and plead for the mercy and the grace of my father than to tough it out here alone. And he makes the journey back home. And the Bible says he was a far way off. I don't know how many of you know what a far way off is, but I do. I can't see what is written on the screen. I can see you're all wearing different colors. I can see some of your faces in the front row. But I can't read what's on the back wall. 
because I'm nearsighted. The father was farsighted. And the father could see every day, is my son coming home? Not yet. Is my son coming home? Not yet. So when he was a great distance off, he saw the shadow and the image of his son. And it wasn't the three-piece suit that his son left with, but it was rags and it was tags. But there's a distinct walk that every child has. I don't know if I'm a parent now, but she's not even walking. But when she does walk, I'll know her walk. I'll know her shape. I know her stride. I know everything about her because I'll be paying so much attention to my child that I know my child inside out and backwards. And when I can see her from a distance, I can know that it is my child coming rather than a stranger. When the father looked out into the road a great distance off, he knew the stagger. It, was, it didn't look like his son. Clearly didn't smell like his son, but he knew that it was his son. And instead of letting a servant deal with his son, he decides himself that he's going to do the unthinkable, pick up his robes, and run towards his son. And even when his son is making his speech that he has practiced for miles, you notice the Bible doesn't say the father talked to the son. He addresses his servants and says, bring the best we have, because my son who is dead is now alive. My son who is lost is now found. My son who was written off by everybody else has come back home, and he's come back home to stay in the house. So we're gonna throw the grandest feast ever. How much more did God do for you and I? You see, earth was the lost sheep. His people are the lost coin. You and I are the lost son. I know in church, When we have our get-togethers, good things happen. I don't know if you've had the privilege of being downstairs after a Sabbath to see the buffet table that is spread. I got a glimpse last Sabbath. I don't think I'm going anywhere after church anymore. But bigger than the food, if you paid attention, to the people around the table. You'll notice that they're laughing, they're smiling, they are happy with one another. There's joy around that table. Bigger than that joy is God's. Because when God decides to throw a party, God's party has no financial restrictions. God's party has the entire angelic choir singing. God's party has a table long as the eye can see. With individual place settings with everyone's name on it. And at God's party, Forget about fine china. You have divine cutlery. And the table is spread with the best food the universe knows. Oh, we love jerk chicken. And we love oxtail, whether veggie or real. And we love rice and peas. But those have nothing on what God has prepared. Take it from a belly that knows. When you get to heaven and you see the spread that God has in store, it would have been worth it to stay in the house. Because the flip side of the coin is this. If you don't want to be a part, you don't get to eat. And if you don't get to eat, you're not in that glory place.
time is up. But I want to leave us with this message. There is nothing worth your salvation. Whatever arguments we may have and disagreements we may have in the house, let's do it side by side, walking to the kingdom. Because being in a family means that we are looking forward to the reunion. And you know the song that's going to be sung at the reunion. Do you? Great grace, God's grace, grace that will pardon and cleanse within. Grace, grace, God's grace, grace that is greater than all my sin. You know what's interesting about this son? The father never brought his mistakes before him. And somehow he forgot his mistakes because he met face to face with true grace. It's family day. And I know I'm not the only person here who has family that are not in the house. If you have somebody that you know of, it could be yourself, it could be a child, it could be your spouse, it could be somebody, a family member or members that are not in the house, they've left or not joined for whatever reason, I invite you to come forward on their behalf. Choose a spot on the floor. And I need you, I'm begging you, to call their name to the gracious God in heaven. As they're coming, sing grace, grace. If the front is filled, kneel in the aisle. Kneel in your pew. Wherever you are, let's kneel and pray to God that in 2015, our sons, our daughters, our husbands, our wives, our friends, our neighbors will come home to him because he's a gracious God and he is patiently waiting. Father, 
I know that you are a loving God. I haven't heard about your love. I've experienced it myself. And that's why I know, Lord, that it is better to be with you than anywhere else in the world. Because we are sinful, Lord, some of us have hurt each other. And some of us have left because of the hurts. I pray that you will forgive us. Because God, you created us to be a family. And if there's a spot missing at the table, the family isn't complete. And so now, Lord, in the name of Jesus, I pray that you will unleash the full bridle of your power and do whatever is necessary, God, to save our sisters and our brothers and our cousins and our nieces and our nephews and our family members, our husbands and our wives, even ourselves, dear God. Do whatever is necessary so that we could be a part of that great feast up in heaven. Lord, there's some of my brothers and sisters here today. For some reason, they don't like being here. Some may not even think that you're real. But God, I rebuke that in the name of Jesus. And I pray now, Lord, that you will make yourself real to them even now. I'm tired out of this world. There's confrontations between policemen and and citizens. There's confrontation between husbands and wives and children and parents and confrontations in homes and in schools and there's confrontation everywhere, God, and until you come, confrontation will exist. And so I pray, dear God, that you will get us ready and that you will come soon. Because beyond the banquet table and the feast and the grand time we're going to have in heaven, Lord, we will see you face to face. And that meeting will be very, very real. So, Father, if there is anything that I have failed to ask, I pray that you will not fail to grant in and through the matchless, mighty, marvelous name of Jesus, we pray. Amen.